Well, thank you, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be here. I know this summer is tough to get people engaged in these things, but uh, hopefully as we go through this, there will be at least something that is uh, worth discussing. And we will have some time at the end if people have their own um, concepts or questions that they want to discuss. So the goal tonight is to talk about myths and facts and quotes in diving physiology. And the reality is we don't have that many facts. What we have is an evolving pattern of understanding, some which is pretty good and some which is not always so good. So when we think about the myths and misconceptions, it doesn't matter what field you're looking at. We can find examples. There are all sorts of examples where people misunderstand or for a variety of reasons, they get something in their mind that isn't quite right, and it gets into the public consciousness. And so we know this is a problem, and so we have to reinforce the idea of the, the critical thinking to make sure that people really do evaluate these things and don't just accept them. And the rules for evaluating claims for me are very simple. You have to look for the data, you have to look for bias, and you have to remember not to lie to yourself. And the data is important. We have a lot of things that people may believe with every fiber of their being, but if there's no evidence, we have to be cautious. There are some conceptual understandings that are meaningful that we just can't test. But in other cases, just because people really believe something doesn't make it true. We have a lot of people in the Flat Earth Society who might argue with this, but um, I think, hopefully, most divers are going to accept that uh, we do live on a round ball that has water that, that kind of hangs around. But so those are the rules for evaluating claims. And then the claims to question. Whenever anybody uses a rationale of I or we have always done it this way, or my instructor or my agency told me, or I read it on the Internet, those are things that should set off the alarm bells, saying that that's really not a good rationale to base things. Now, I'm not saying everything on the Internet is bad. But we have to make sure that that is not the only foundation because anybody can put almost anything on the internet. And so you really still have to go back to that critical thinking. Now, if we look at misconceptions concerning diving, these are things that a lot of non-divers have, but they're easy to overcome. And we can probably all come up with these lists. I, I'm sure everybody has had somebody say, oh, I couldn't possibly dive. My ears hurt when I go to the bottom of the pool. Well, of course, everybody's ears hurt. You have to learn to equalize. So this list is nothing new. It's just an example of, of misconceptions that really are common to people who have no orientation to diving. These are not a big deal because people can easily learn the facts and then get beyond these things. What is more challenging are the myths. The things that get into the public psyche, and when I say public, I'm talking diving public psyche, and they hang in there. And sometimes they hang in there because they're reinforced by experienced people. And that could be for a number of reasons. It could be because they just don't understand or because their learning was so long ago and they haven't really updated since they first learned. Or in some cases, it's because people believe odd things because they're trying to find a way to be original. They're trying to establish somehow their superiority. And so they hang on to an idea and they promote it as though it's some novel insight when in fact, it's just nonsense. And we have to worry about those things because sometimes we can get arguments that are really compelling, at least superficially. People will say things that sound good and they're from people that we may trust. But if they don't pass the test of rationality, we have to be really careful not to fall too far for them. So it's, it's a challenge. And the real problem that we have is when the misconceptions involve issues that have a high threat potential. And let's use decompression sickness or decompression stress as an example. We know that decompression sickness is not anywhere close to the most common problem in diving. The most common problems associated with diving involve the ears. But most ear problems don't really give you too much hardship. And so we don't worry about that. The ultimate risk is not that high. We worry about decompression sickness, of course, because it's got a potential for 
major impact, even life threat, if it goes awry. So we have to worry about misconceptions that affect those high risk areas. And let's start, and this is something Barbara had asked me to, to compare modalities, or she asked a question that, that uh, came, this was my interpretation of how to address it. Let's just briefly compare the different modalities of diving and think about what are the, the chief, the most important factors in each of these elements. So of course, free diving and equipment there's virtually none. You need a bathing suit and some kind of mask that uh, you can equalize or don't have to equalize, and life is good. Open circuit, we've got modest equipment needs. Closed circuit, our biggest challenge is the complexity of the equipment and the fact that that does add an extra burden. So we have three very different experiences here. For bailout gas supply, well, free divers have none. They may have a safety diver, but they basically have nothing on board to help them in most cases. So that's definitely a concern. Open circuit, you've got partial bailout. A lot of people think of that octopus regulator as a redundant system, but it's actually only partially redundant. It's an extra mouthpiece, but for most people, it's not an extra gas supply. And so it's a partial redundancy at best. For closed circuit diving, we typically have fully redundant systems. And so again, very different communities. For descent, this one is actually important from the point of view of decompression safety. When we think about descent and we think about diving and we think about research, most of our research is based on the fairly slow transit time of the compressed gas diver. And so if you look at 80 years of research, it's mostly with divers who are traveling slowly. But if we start with free divers, free divers are typically going down and coming up at a rate of about one to two meters per second. So three to six feet per second. That is so much quicker than what we see in, in, in compressed gas diving that it's actually a very different experience. And we'll come back to the, an example of that. But so free diving is quite different because of the fast transit time. For open circuit, it's variable. Some people can go down pretty quick or come up quickly. For closed circuit, it tends to be slower because you're trying to maintain your fixed oxygen content while you go. And so again, three very different patterns. Bottom time, breath hold, free diving, of course it's short, open circuit, eh, moderate, and closed circuit, it's highly flexible. If you've got the time and equipment and gas, you, you can actually do quite a bit. Now, I'd mentioned decompression earlier. Let's think about this from the point of view of these different communities. One of the questions that comes up is, do free divers ever have to worry about decompression sickness? Classically, people would say, no, there's not enough inert gas in the lungs or in the tissues for it to be a problem. But we also have a number of free divers who, when doing extreme dives, so let's say well over, even say well over 200 feet or doing repetitive dives, they have symptoms that really sound an awful lot like those of decompression sickness. And the the naysayers would, would argue there's no way, there's just not enough gas. But I would say, here's where we're trapped by our lack of knowledge. Our knowledge is based on the slow transit time of compressed gas divers, but free divers are moving so quickly that we can actually see transient supersaturation in the brain, which is so well perfused, so much blood flow, that we can probably get transient symptoms that appear quickly and resolve quickly because of the high blood flow, but they may very well appear. So it's possible that decompression sickness is a real risk to deep and repetitive free divers. And we don't see the evidence of it from compressed gas diving because that diving is so different. We're not traveling so quickly. We're coming up more slowly on compressed gas, either open circuit or closed circuit. And so we cannot trust the data we have from those dives to really evaluate free diving. Now, what about pulmonary risk? It's, it's a very different view here as well. The free diver has to worry mostly about squeezes and you can get a fair bit of, of uh, ruptured tissue and you can have even a life threat from squeezes. And so squeezes are probably 
the big risk for free diving. For open circuit, it's more the overpressurization arterial gas embolism and a little bit less of the same for closed circuit divers, just because they're typically breathing on a very low pressure loop. So once more, different loops, different concerns. And finally, last point I'll make on these different communities, narcosis. It's probably, again, very possible with free divers because we see symptoms that sound an awful lot like narcosis in some of these deep free divers. And it is very likely that we do see it as we can with open circuit and even closed circuit. Where we see it is, is different, but it probably is a factor in all three. So that was a, a brief overview of, of why we can't always answer a question simply because sometimes you have to ask exactly what group the person is interested in before you craft an answer because it can be quite different. So let's talk about myths in diving. And Barbara set this one up and she wasn't a ringer in the house. This was a, a natural comment on hers when she said, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Well, I expect that at least some of you have been on dive boats even recently where they say something along the lines of dehydration is the number one cause of decompression sickness. This statement is often repeated and it's absolute nonsense. It is 100% a myth of diving. And so let's look at the reality. The far more important concern in terms of, of decompression stress is the dive profile. The dehydration is important, but it is a tiny, tiny factor in light of the dive profile. And the way I describe it, you could be as shriveled up as a raisin. And if you didn't have a provocative dive profile, you're not getting bent. So it is not dehydration that bends you. And so the rational view is that sound hydration is important for health. But if you focus on this as a solution for decompression sickness, it's doing two things that are problematic. One, it might distract you from the factor or factors that are more important. And that could be the dive profile and then the exercise and the thermal stress. So there are things that are far, far more important than state of hydration. And then the other problem is that excessive hydration can create other risks. One of the things that is increasingly recognized, but still not quite clear enough for most people is immersion pulmonary edema. You can get symptoms that are associated with a fluid congestion in the lung. And one of the risk factors of immersion pulmonary edema is hyperhydration. And so for the person who overreacts and they think, oh man, I just have to keep drinking, uh, you could be setting yourself up for another hazard. So again, the rational view, hydration is important, but you need to be reasonable about it. The best way to check is to check your first morning sample of urine. If your first morning sample of urine after a good night's sleep tends to be on the clear side, your base hydration is solid. If your urine in the morning tends to be dark, and that's not due to, say, a multivitamin that's making it turn greenish, um, you should probably drink more. But you can't say much else about it. During the day, your urine concentration is not a good indication of your hydration because it depends on what's happened in the last 15 or 30 minutes. Now, if you look at those samples in the bottom of the screen, that's a list of six different urine samples in deep technical divers. And you can see that sample on the left, this is a person who's peeing what we call ultra filtrate. Basically, this is about as, as, uh, as light as it can get. And the person on the right is pretty much able to stand a stick up in it. And so we've got very different concentrations of urine. None of these people had symptoms of DCS. And we see these patterns all the time with divers. Dehydration has become a bit of a boogeyman, and I'll tell you why this probably is. One of the reasons this is probably the case is because when someone gets symptomatic DCS, they tend to develop a fluid shift that can look like dehydration. In other words, decompression sickness creates a situation that looks like DCS, so people think, Oh, dehydration was a problem. No, dehydration was the outcome of the fluid shift following decompression sickness.
So we had an interesting misunderstanding here. And um, bottom line, make sure you have a good base hydration. So make sure when you wake up in the morning, you've got good clear urine. But then if you don't want to drink too much because you don't want to pee in a dry suit or you don't want to be peeing every half an hour, it's okay. You really don't have to overdo it. Okay, the deepest dive should always come first for decompression safety. This is another thing that we have been um, following as a rule for decades and decades. But this is actually a myth. And the reality is really quite interesting. The body has no depth sensor. The body doesn't actually measure whether you've been at 50 feet, 100 feet, or 200 feet. All that matters to the body is the relative pressure change and the effect on whatever dissolved gas there is. But there's no, there's no tracking of depth. So it doesn't matter where you went on the previous dive. It really matters more how long you stayed there and how long it's been since you were there. And so the previous dive can certainly influence your subsequent dive. It can limit you if you want to follow tables. But physiologically, it is not actually logical to say the deepest dive always has to be first. And the reason why it's important to understand this, we have had a number of cases where people have asked questions and they say, you know, in the first dive on this charter, I was taken to a sand field at 120 feet to make sure that our first dive was deeper than our second dive on the wreck that was re really the reason we were going there. And that is crazy logic. They are exaggerating the concept of first dive being the deepest and they're putting people at risk to go somewhere where there's no interest in going just so they can follow an arbitrary rule. The rational view is, is pretty clear. If all things are equal, sure, your deepest dive should be planned first. But if there is any reasonable justification to do a reverse profile dive, to not have your deepest dive first, that is perfectly valid. You still have to plan for your decompression. And yes, the dive before will influence the dive after. But there is no inherent reason why we have to plan the deepest dive first. And there are reasons why it can be problematic. Okay, next one. Following your dive computer will keep you safe from DCS. And this is one that we frequently see manifested in people who get decompression sickness. And they're really surprised to say, but, 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 but my computer said it was okay. Or, you know, oh my God, this was completely undeserved. Both of those statements should probably be stricken from the diving vocabulary. Because the reality is almost any decompression or recompression and decompression cycle uh, can produce significant stress. And there is no guarantee that a model is going to protect you because those models are all rudimentary. We have made great stride in understanding in the last 50 years, but the reality is our dive computers are only really good at measuring pressure and time. They are not able to measure most of the nearly two dozen variables that influence individual risk. And so even though we've got really impressive sounding models and people will say so many great things about them, they are terrible at actually assessing our individual physiology. And so decompression can be unsafe for any number of reasons. And we can't get too worked up if we get bent in what we think is a within the limits dive, because that's kind of the probabilistic nature of decompression sickness. There is a chance every time you go out, if there's any appreciable decompression stress, there is a chance that you could end up with a bad outcome. And that's the nature of the game. And so rather than saying this was undeserved or I don't get it. You should actually try to understand what are the factors that influence the risk. And if you make that, that objective evaluation, you can really improve your future safety. Whereas if you just say, oh, it was undeserved, you're not likely to really learn from it and improve. So a big myth to control. So the rational view, computers don't get DCS, divers do. So don't worry, if you get bent, your computer will be fine. 
We don't have to treat it. It will be just fine. But you do have to build in the buffers for personal safety because there's no guarantee that an algorithm or a table will be appropriate in all cases. So I find extra safety buffers are cheap insurance. My rule is simple, first in, last out. I'm happy to go anywhere, but then I want to be the last one in the water hanging and finishing off those, those safety stops or decompression stops. And that can make life a lot more comfortable because you're not as likely to be surprised. Okay, let's just look at the variability that exists because I know that so many of us have a great faith in the algorithms and the dive tables. This is just to give you an example of kind of what we don't know. So this table shows you six different, oh, pardon me, five different um, dive table limits. So this is just air diving limits and the numbers don't really matter. What matters is the last column on the right. And this shows you the percentage difference between the most conservative and the most liberal. And you can see across the depth range between 40 and 100 feet that it varies between 25 and 67%. That's a pretty big range. And now think about it. Everyone who made those tables thought they were coming up with legitimate limits. If we don't know what the hell the legitimate limits are, this shows you that there's variability in physiology that isn't covered by dive tables or dive computers. Now, this should be somewhat impressive. Say, wow, up to 67% difference. Now let's look at what those limits look like when we're doing repetitive dives. Let's say your first dive was to 60 feet for 50 minutes followed by an hour service interval. These are the same five tables and you can see the same percentage difference in the right-hand column. And you can now see that the allowable limits vary up to 700%. Whoa. <laughs> now, 700% of a very small time isn't actually quite as impressive as it seems, but you should get the idea. Again, each person or person or team who made these tables thought they had legitimate limits. We don't know the individual limit on a diver. That's why we need the safety buffers. Okay. Let's keep going on decompression because, again, it's got the potential to end up with a serious life or health threat. So it's kind of important. What about this one? Deep stops improve dive safety. Deep stops are an interesting example of how wildfires spread through the diving community. When the first groups discovered this concept of deep stops, it was sold so well that with zero evidence, this was broadly adopted by technical and even non-technical diving communities. And it took 15 years before it was determined that deep stops don't improve safety. So the concept of the deep stop was simple. Let's stop at a deeper point on the ascent and that way we will guarantee that no bubble formation will occur at that point. And, it, and that's true, that works. That absolutely works. But there's a problem. When you stop deep, any tissue that is not saturated will continue to take on inert gas. And so while you're staying there, some of your tissues are still taking up gas that has to be eliminated. So that's the main problem. But here's the second problem. And that is in how people implemented it. And I'm going to pick on Naui, not just to pick on Naui, but because it's a, a pretty easy example. They went public with deep stops early and they decided they wanted to keep it simple. And they said, we don't want to make it too tough for divers. So we're going to say, do a deep stop at half the maximum depth. And so for 100 feet, half the maximum depth is 50 feet. But remember, 100 feet is four atmospheres pressure. Half the pressure is 33 feet, two atmospheres. And so we have a huge mismatch. For convenience, we're saying use half the, the depth, but your body doesn't care about depth. Remember, there's no depth center, sensor. All it cares about is the relative pressure change. So when you're stopping too deep, all you're doing is taking on more inert gas. You're stopping at a point where 
we would never expect bubbles to form. And so all you're doing is you're adding the decompression burden later on. So that's the reality. And so the rational view, the time spent at deep stops is really just increasing your inner gas uptake. And any unsaturated, unsaturated tissue will, will take up gas. So we have to be mindful of that. And so when we're thinking about decompression stress, we should be thinking about the relative pressure changes and, and not absolute pressure, not, not absolute depth. So if we really want to think about controlling decompression, we shouldn't be looking at half the depth. We should be thinking about half the pressure and even less than that. So let's, let's put another explanatory note in here. I'm not sure what the backgrounds of everybody is. For open water level recreational divers, if you're diving in, in no more than 100, maybe 130 feet, half the depth is really skewed from half the pressure. But if you're deeper technical diving, half the depth is actually not so bad. So this is actually more of a problem, this simple computation of, of deep stops, it's more of a problem for the recreational diver than the technical diver. But technical divers have a greater decompression burden overall. So mindfulness is critical. Deep stops are a problem. They don't work. And we have to spend time thinking about what our goal is for safe decompression. It's not just about stopping deep. Now, let's talk a bit about conservatism that you can use. There are a couple of conservatism strategies that are available. And one of the ones that I think is most intuitively clear is the gradient factor correction. And this is something that has been applied to the Buhlmann model, which is a common model that is used in a fair number of computers. And the one of the biggest strengths of it is that this code was released publicly and a lot of people looked at it and found a bunch of errors and then they were corrected and it was re-released. So a lot of people check these data and I like that. That gives me a lot of confidence. Now, how do, de how do gradient factors work? They are indexed to something called an M value, which is actually a, a term that was created in the 50s um, by Robert Workman, and he was doing decompression modeling for the US Navy. And an M value is the theoretical maximum amount of supersaturation that a tissue compartment can tolerate before bad things happen. In other words, we know when we go under pressure, we're under greater pressure, as soon as we come back up to the surface, we are off gassing. We're supersaturated, so we're eliminating gas. Well, the M value was a theoretical construct of just how much supersaturation could exist in each of the compartments that were used to predict safe limits. Now, the interesting thing is this concept was developed before we had ultrasound and before we had as much experience as we have now. And so what really has become clear is that both bubbles and decompression sickness can occur well within the M value limits. So the M value is not a universally safe limit. It is a mathematical guess as to what might be the limit. And that really is what it is. So what gradient factors do is they say, okay, you don't want to go to 100% of a theoretical limit that we don't know whether it's safe or not. Let's just make it simple and let's just dial back and go to a fraction of that limit. And the beauty of gradient factors is that you can apply them to a diving computer and the diving computer will still give you guidance as to what to do. And you don't have to second guess it because it's still on that computer screen that we really have a lot of faith in. But instead of giving us the original limit, it will give us a revised limit that is hopefully more in keeping with your risk tolerance. And so the Buhlmann, uh, pardon me, the gradient factors are described usually as two numbers. And the example I have here is 3070. And for decompression dives, that 30 is the point in the ascent where your first stop is required by the computer. So to put it, to say it another way, when you get to 30% of that M value theoretical limit, the computer says, okay, stop here and hold here until a little bit of gas clears. And then once you're released from that stop depth, 
the rest of the ascent will not be allowed if you stay within the guidance of the computer it will not allow you to go over the second value in this case 0.7 or 70 percent of the m value limit so conceptually it's pretty simple 30 70 30 is where we are forced to do the first top and 70 is the percent of the m value that we won't ever exceed if we follow that model now let me give you a picture of this let's say you're someone who believes in deep stops and this diver who's diving 1585, this diver believes in deep stops because if you're, if you're using your GF low of 15, it means that when you're at 15% of the M value, it's forcing you to do your first stop. Well, if you stop at that point, most of your tissues are going to be taking on inert gas because you're way too deep to be off gassing for most tissue. And so with a 1585, you're continuing to off gas in the first stop. And then when you're able to ascend to 85% of that limit that we don't know is universally safe, we may not have much buffer. I don't know on an individual basis how much buffer there is, but this basically, this profile is for someone who believes in deep stops and they think they're bulletproof. And some would argue and they say, no, that's not true. But actually that's exactly what this, this setting is doing someone who believes in deep stops, and they pretty much trust the M value limit. Alternatively, let's say you go in with a gradient factor setting of 4070. The big difference here, when you leave the bottom, you are getting off the bottom because you're going up to 40% of the M value. So you are not on gassing as much during the ascent because you're getting the hell out of dodge as soon as you leave the bottom. And that's probably good. And then once you clear that first stop, it's allowing you to go to no more than 70% of that theoretical limit for the rest of the ascent. So that's much more conservative. That's, that's probably beneficial. Now, there's a cost to this. When you do this, it means you have more decompression time. But I'm a firm believer that I love being in the water. I don't view extra time in the water as a penalty. I do view decompression sickness as a penalty. So let me give you a simple example here. This is for a dive to 180 feet. And I used a slightly deep dive for the recreational community because it, it, it made a, a good graphic display, but you could do this for almost any depth you wanted. But so a dive to 180 feet or 20 minutes on the bottom, you can see for GF low, if you're on the 15 versus the 40, it's calling you to do deeper stops. So that first stop on the 1585 is at 79 feet as opposed to 69 feet. And you may think, oh, you know, it's only 10 feet different. How much does it matter? But you have to remember how concentrated the gas is at 79 feet. When you're breathing concentrated gas, you're taking on a lot more inert gas during that deep stop. And so that's what the, the first number does. The second number really controls how much time you have towards the end of the decompression profile. And you can see that if you drop from 85 to 70, yes, it's increasing your decompression time substantially in the shallow zone. That's true. And it's increasing it slightly in the, in the deeper stops as well. But... There is a cost for lowering GF high, but the benefit is that your risk of decompression sickness is much, much lower. Now, this is a, a really busy table, and I don't want to kill you with this, but I don't want you to think that gradient factors are the only conservative setting we have. If you're diving a computer that uses an RGBM, a reduced bubble gradient model, or a VPM, varying permeability model, it has different conservatism settings. It has conservatism, depending on the computer, either 0, 1, and 2, or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I want to just give you the impression of what happens with the bubble model, the VPM model conservatism. The problem is, these models are largely based on belief in deep stops. Now, with some computers, you can turn off the deep stops 
But for most of them, when you increase the conservatism level from zero up towards five, you can see on the lower left that it is actually making your first stop at a deeper depth. And so what's happening in this case is that as you're adding conservatism, it's actually forcing you to do deeper stops. And we now know that those deeper stops are not improving decompression safety. They're actually making you less safe. So you could say, well, maybe that's still okay if it adds enough time in the shallows. The problem is it's not adding enough time in the shallows to make up for the extra time at depth. Now, if we go back to the gradient factors, we're doing our first stop at generally shallower depths. And then you'll notice we have much longer times in the shallow range. And so you have to decide what you believe in. Do you believe in gradient factors? Do you believe in deep stops? What do you believe? Most importantly, you cannot just run on trust. You have to learn what models your computers are using and then decide rationally what is the best course of action for you. And I'm not saying you have to trust me. I'm saying do your own homework. You decide, but don't trust someone if their only rationale is I've always done it this way or my instructor told me or I read it on the internet. Try to find a better justification than that before you believe things. Okay, we're not quite done with decompression. I think we have a couple more of these. So the next one, intravascular bubbles are produced after all dives. Some people say, why should I worry about bubbles? We have them on every dive. And the reality is that's not true. We don't have measurable bubbles on all dives and we can make behavioral changes that probably alter our risk. And so we shouldn't just ignore decompression stress and say, ah, nothing to worry about. Instead, let's think about what we can do to reduce the risk. And to give you one visual example, this was a recreational dive to 515 feet. Now that may sound a little extreme to some people and it's true, but it was a recreational dive to 515 feet. And you might say, oh my goodness, those people are going to bubble. Well, this is the heart of this diver and there are no bubbles visible in that echo clip. So this is a clip of the heart and we can see the black is, is the lumen, the, the volume of the heart. There are no bubbles present in that clip. Now, if we had more time, I could literally show you hundreds of clips where we either have bubbles or don't have bubbles. What we know is that by changing decompression practice, we can reduce our bubble formation. And if we have no bubbles, we are highly confident there will be no DCS. And so that's a good thing. Important to be mindful. So, okay. I just said that it's very possible for us to control bubbles. And if we don't have bubbles, we're 95% confident there won't be symptomatic DCS. But does it work the other way? Do bubbles equal decompression sickness? And the answer here is no. Bubbles are far more common than symptoms. So VGE, venous gas emboli, bubbles, they're, an, they're a marker of decompression stress but we don't treat bubbles, we treat symptoms. And so the rational view is pretty straightforward. We would like to avoid bubbles because then we're pretty sure that we're not going to have problems. But if we do have bubbles, they're maybe at most giving us a 40% probability of developing symptoms. And I'll show you this graphically. This is a plot of some flying after diving data that we collected at Duke. So this was, um, I forget, this was uh, three years of data on flying after diving. And what you're looking at is on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, this is the time between the dive and the subsequent simulated flight. And it was a standard flight to what you might expect for worst case scenario for commercial flight. 8,000 foot cabin altitude for four hours. And the white line is showing you the rate of bubbles. And the purple line is showing you the rate of decompression sickness. Because in this study, we actually took subjects to the point of developing symptoms. 
we were one of the two labs in North America that had approval from the ethics committee to bend divers because we were really good at unbending them. So they allowed this to happen. And I think you can see that if you look at the white line, as you move towards the left and the time between the dive and the flight gets shorter and shorter, we get more and more and more bubbles. But it's not until we get down to about three hours or less that we start to see a big spike in symptoms. And so this is to reinforce the concept that bubbles don't equal decompression sickness. But I can add a little bit more. The white line is showing you all bubble grades. If we now only look at the highest two levels of bubbles on a five point scale, it's that light blue line that you see here. And so you can see now that we still have more bubbles than decompression sickness, but the lines are a lot closer together. And so this is another bit of a take home message. While bubbles on their own, we don't equate with decompression sickness, we do view them as a marker of decompression stress and high grade bubbles are the ones we really would like to avoid because they have a greater likelihood of, of being associated with symptoms. Still only a 40% probability, but if I had a choice, I'd much rather change my dive practices so I was pretty confident I was bubble free. Okay, let's turn away from decompression sickness directly and let's ask a simple one. Enriched air nitrox, is it safer than air? And when the voodoo gas came out, one of the ways it was marketed by, was by saying, oh, it's much safer than air. And unfortunately, people bought the hype. The reality is it depends completely on how nitrox is dived. If you dive nitrox and you dive it to the limit of nitrox tables, your risk of decompression sickness is the same risk as diving air to the limit of air tables. because. When you make a nitrox table, all you're doing is you're mathematically adjusting for the fraction of nitrogen. There's no magic in nitrox tables. There's no independent research in nitrox tables. They are just a mathematical correction. And math does not equal physiology. And so if you dive nitrox to the limit of nitrox tables, you have the same risk as diving air to the limit of air tables. So the rational view. If you use nitrox on air tables, your risk is lower, for sure. But if you use the, the nitrox limits, you're not getting a decompression advantage. What you're getting is a time advantage. You're able to stay longer for the same degree of risk, but the limits are just a mathematically corrected value. I hope that makes sense. Okay, next one. My DCS was undeserved. And I think it'll be clear after our earlier discussion that this is one that makes my teeth really, I grit my teeth on this. The reality is virtually any decompression, uh, compression, decompression cycle will produce decompression stress. And here's my rule of thumb. If you have an exposure that is greater than about 50% the of the US Navy no decompression limits, DCS is on the table as a possibility. It doesn't mean it's likely, but it's a possibility. Since it's a possibility, you shouldn't say it's undeserved. I really have to shake my head when people say, come on, yes, I went to 200 feet, but I was well within the limits. It was completely undeserved. No, you did a dive to 200 feet. There was a decompression dive. There's nothing undeserved about it. You fell on the wrong side of the probabilistic curve. So the rational view is we have to accept the risks and moderate them ourselves because the tables are, and the computers are not giving you a magic solution to your risk exposure. So there's no point denying the risk. We really have to make sure we understand what we can do to have a risk that we can live with comfortably. Okay, my dive computer evaluates thermal stress. This is another one that is, I think, really cool marketing for the manufacturers. Most of the manufacturers put thermometers in dive computers so it measures the water temperature. And so a lot of people think that those dive computers measure the thermal status of the diver. But we know that's not true. You could be wearing the same computer while you're in a dry suit with undergarments or while you're naked. 
the temperature is the same. The computer has the same information. It doesn't have any information about your thermal stress. So the reality is dive computers are only measuring water temperature. They really know nothing about the thermal status of the diver. And I, I should have also said, you could have a diver who's using active heating systems and that diver is way out of spec. That computer is completely out of touch with their reality. So the rational view is it's not the water temperature that creates the stress. It's the thermal status of the individual. And that depends on the protective garments they're wearing. And so you cannot expect your computer to know this. And this is really important. Back to dehydration. Dehydration is nothing compared to thermal stress. And let me show you the example. Oh, I'll show you the example in a minute. We have one more of these before we get to that example. Being warm is always safer. Some people think if I'm warm, I'm safer. That's not true. You're more comfortable perhaps, but not safer. Being warm increases your blood flow. And depending on whether that's in a period of uptake or elimination of inert gas, it can sometimes improve your, your risk profile or it can make it worse. And so the reality is you have to be very thoughtful about your, your thermal status and especially with active heating. So now let me show you the best example of this. This is from a US Navy study that was done in Panama City, Florida. And they have a huge wet pot and they were able to control the water temperature in this wet pot. And what they were able to do is change the water temperature quickly from a cool temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit to a warm temperature, almost body temperature of 97 degrees Fahrenheit. And they did a series of dives to 120 feet. And they started with a 30 minute bottom time, but then it changed over time. But so these dives were all to 120 feet. The divers were exercising throughout. And I hope this, this picture makes sense at the bottom. I hope you understand that if a diver went down warm, they would have maximal vasodilation in their periphery. So they'd have more blood flow to the periphery more inner gas uptake. So being warm on the way down actually increases risk. And being cold or cool on the way up is also augmenting risk because at that point, your tissues have a lot of inner gas, but you don't have the blood flow, so you're not eliminating the inner gas. So the highest risk combination was being warm on the way down and cold on the way up. Going down cool and coming up cool or cold was a little better because you controlled uptake, but it was not only damn uncomfortable, it was also still a pretty high rate of DCS. Warm and warm was a little better, but if you're warm on the way down, you take on so much inner gas that it's hard to overcome that. And so that was a higher risk window. The safest combination is to go down cool so you don't take up more inner gas and then come up warm so you eliminate more inner gas. Now, when I show this to most people, I say, okay, conceptually, I get it. If I'm cool the way down, yeah, I won't take up more inner gas, but I don't care. I want to be comfortable. Here's why you should care. In this study, if those divers went down warm and came up cool, when they did the 30-minute bottom time, they had 22% symptomatic decompression sickness. That's a big number. 22% of the subjects develop symptoms. Now, if they went down cool and came up warm, they were able to go out to 70 minutes. They more than doubled the bottom time and only had 1% decompression sickness. That is a big impact. And if we now, again, go back to the dehydration comment, Dehydration makes this tiny little difference here, and the thermal status makes a difference that is off the screen in terms, of, in terms of impact. And so it is really important that you're thoughtful of your thermal status. And we could make the same kind of profile for exercise status because exercise has similar effects. If you exercise on the way down in the bottom, you increase your uptake. If you exercise a little on the way up, you increase elimination. But if you exercise a lot on the way up, you can promote bubble formation. It's kind of like shaking the pop bottle before you open it. So exercise is even trickier than thermal because not only would change blood flow, it can 
precipitate bubbles forming. So our biggest factors in decompression sec is, uh, stress, number one is the dye profile, number two and three are exercise and thermal status. Okay. Next myth, I will get worn, a warning before I pass out during breath hold. This is something we hear all the time. People want to do low and breath hold dives and free diving. And some people say, oh, you know, I'm so experienced. I'll have a warning. This is an absolute crock. The interesting thing about the warnings that we get to breathe, they're based on the carbon dioxide levels. And if you hyperventilate to blow off CO2, you eliminate any warning for the urge to breathe, and you can lose consciousness with no indication whatsoever. And this is why hyperventilation has to be used with great caution. The Navy allows the equivalent of two to three total vital capacity exchanges prior to breath hold. And that's probably okay. We try to get people to pass out in the lab, and we couldn't get anybody to pass out if that's all they did. But if you hyperventilate more than that, you can easily get people passing out. And person on the left was actually, her in consciousness was, bad, was badly impaired during a um, competitive, she was actually training for a, a world competition and she, was, she lost functional consciousness. And that's very common, you see that. And it's only because of the good safety protocols and standby divers that uh, these people are able to do well with very little risk of injury. And the person on the left is actually being brought up by a recovery, free diving recovery vest, vest, which automatically deploys if they go too deep or stay for too long. And so there are ways you can protect divers, but hyperventilation is a big hazard. And let me show you the physiology of this because if we could eliminate the hyperventilation hazard, I believe that we could kick out 50, if not 75% of the fatalities we have in breath hold. So this is an issue that has big impact on diving safety. So this is a plot over time of a breath hold. Everything in blue relates to carbon dioxide in your blood, everything in yellow to oxygen. So everybody understands that when you hold your breath, your oxygen levels fall. We consume oxygen, they fall. Okay, no problem. We also should know that when we hold our breath, we accumulate carbon dioxide because it's a waste product of consuming the oxygen. And that's understandable. I think every diver should get that. Now there are two reference lines you have to understand. The first is the urge to breathe line. When we get to about 45, 46 millimeters of mercury, we get the urge to breathe. And that number isn't that important for you to remember because the reality is that's an average number and we don't really know what's going on in any one tissue. And so this is a whole body estimate. When you get to about 45 or 46 millimeters of mercury, you have an urge to breathe. And we have that every breath of every day. And for most people, unless you've got COPD and then you lose that. But for most healthy people, this is what drives our ventilation. The other thing line you have to know for reference is the level of oxygen required to maintain consciousness. As long as your average O2 is somewhere over 30 mil, millimeters uh, mercury, you are likely to maintain consciousness. Now, if we think of our normal breathing cycle, the difference between when we cross that urge to breathe line for CO2 right here, and when we would cross that line for maintaining oxygen, the time buffer between these two, the time delay is our safety buffer. That is what keeps us out of trouble because we have an urge to breathe far before we have um, too little oxygen to maintain consciousness. Now, what happens when we hyperventilate? A lot of people, not so many now, but there's still a fair number of people who think that by hyperventilating, they're increasing their oxygen stores. That is both true and not important because when you hyperventilate, you don't increase your oxygen stores much at all. The difference may buy you three extra seconds of breath full time. But when you hyperventilate, you are eliminating massive amounts of CO2 
because we tend to accumulate CO2 in our bodies because we use it for acid-base buffering. And so it's an important part of our bloodstream. So when we hyperventilate, it's not the oxygen changes that are important. It's the fact that we're getting rid of CO2. And when we get rid of CO2 and then hold our breath, we accumulate CO2 at roughly the same rate. But what you can see now is that it's kind of a crapshoot as to whether we're going to cross the urge to breathe line before or after we cross the line of, oops, not enough oxygen to stay conscious. And that's what hyperventilation does to you. And to make it even worse, a lot of free divers are diving vertically. So they're not just laying down static in a pool and holding their breath. And so this next figure shows the same curves we have after hyperventilation. And this is a cartoon that I'm showing you now, the schematic. But I hope this makes sense to you as divers that when you hold your breath and go down in depth, you're increasing the pressure on your body. That actually drives up the oxygen content. So in the first part of the dive, your PO2 in the blood is actually pretty high. But then when you turn around, around here and start coming up, not only are we consuming oxygen, but it is falling because we are going up and the pressure on our bodies is being reduced. And so you have a massively precipitous fall in O2. And so even if you had a warning, it wouldn't be enough to take care of you because of that rapid fall. But we don't even have a warning because if we look at the CO2 in the first part of the dive, the CO2 is actually driven up by that increase in pressure but when we reverse and are coming up to the surface, we actually have a stabilization of the CO2. And so it's quite common for breath hold divers as they approach the surface to be surprised and say, wow, I feel really good. I don't have much urge to breathe at all. I'm really feeling boom, and they're unconscious. And so hyperventilation really is responsible for the lion's share of the fatalities that we have in free diving. And so it's very important to understand that what you're doing with hyperventilation is you are literally eating into the physiological safety buffer. And you may get away with it, and you may not. There are no guarantees, but it's always increasing your risk. Okay, a quick one. Scuba diving provides good physical fitness. I wish this were true. Unfortunately, the most skilled divers the smartest divers are doing as little work as possible underwater so they can conserve gas supply and they can save it for when they might need it for an emergent event. So the reality is you can build a little bit of strength if you're schlepping tanks around all the time, but the reality is you need physical fitness outside of diving and it should be removed from diving. You do not want to be that pop bottle that's shaken by exercise. You would like to keep your exercise the on a different day from your diving activity, not exercising on the same day. And with that, I wanted to ask you, we've gone through a, a whole roster of these things, and I want to ask you if there are any specific favorite myths or facts you want to test. And so you can put those in the chat and we'll see if anybody has any, or if you have questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, there's a question in the chat, one about, can I use the computer's default conservative mode? I guess, is there a benefit to that? Is that the way, based upon what you're saying? Well, sure, you can use the conservative's default mode, but there's no guarantee that it's necessarily going to be the one that's appropriate. It depends on the computer. There's no simple answer. You first have to look at what kind of model the computer uses to know whether it's using the um, a bubble model with deep stops or a bubble model without deep stops or whether it's using gradient factors. And then you have to look at the numbers. So on some computers, the default is reasonable. On others, I actually don't believe it is reasonable. So this is not a simple one. What you have to do is you have to look at your computer and really find out what the guidance is and then what your flexibility is in adjusting it. And if you don't have sufficient flexibility to get to where you think you should be conservatively, you should change computers. Hmm. Wow. I'm a, definitely more of a fan of the, the, the Buhlman model, the gradient factors model. And um, 
I like those computers that give flexibility so you can change the gradient factors. Now, having said that, if you're diving in the recreational range, say to no more than 60, 80, 90 feet, most dive computers are actually going to give you pretty similar guidance. It's when you go beyond that that the differences between models really become apparent. So most of the models are pretty good in the real recreational zone, but the deeper you go or the more extreme you want to dive, the more you really have to be mindful. So good question. Sorry, I couldn't give you a really simple answer. Um, I have a question. What about all this um, talk in the free dive world about uh, building up your CO2 tolerance and, you know. Yeah, well, you can certainly, your, your CO2 tolerance will vary a small amount, but it's probably not the biggest adaptation you're getting. One of the things that we see in free divers, if you ever talk to somebody who takes basic physiology or medical school physiology, they'll be told that the standard vital capacity of a human being, a, a standard size human being, is about six liters. In other words, you can either inhale or exhale six liters on average. Well, we now know with some free divers, it is not surprising anymore to see vital capacities of 13 liters. Hmm. And so you could fantasize that you're doing a lot to change your CO2 tolerance, and you're probably not going to do too much. The bigger adaptation with repeated training and exercise is that you're making adjustments to a system that historically we thought was inflexible, but now we know it's very flexible. The example I always use is a fellow named Martin Stepanek who held several records. He will take a cantaloupe, put it up against his abdominal wall, he'll inhale, and the cantaloupe will completely disappear under his rib cage. We used to think that the diaphragm was fixed in its range. We now know that with training, the diaphragm, like most muscles, can adapt and become much more hypermobile. So the reason divers, free divers can go so much deeper than used to be believed to be theoretically possible is because of physical adaptations. Those are probably more important than CO2 tolerance. And I'm not saying CO2 tolerance doesn't play a small role, but we have other things that are probably a little bit more meaningful. Okay, how can we tell what model our computer has? This is where you have to read the manual. We have a lot of people can, well, mine's the purple one. Sorry, <laughs> that doesn't help. You have to find out what the make is and you have to usually go online or go to your model uh, or go to your, your uh, instruction manual. And usually somewhere in there it will be described. But here's the challenge. It's the implementation by the manufacturer that controls exactly how a model works. And you'll often see that it's a modified Buhlmann or a modified RGBM. And those are usually proprietary modifications. And it is really hard to tell exactly what was done. Um, but you can start by looking up your computer, finding out what model it runs. And if it were me, if it was RGBM, I would give it to somebody I didn't like and I'd buy a computer with gradient factors. Um, but that would be me. Uh, maybe don't give it to someone you don't like, but I would, I'm would. i not a fan of the RGBM or VPM models. I think that especially when they're incorporating deep stops, they are counterproductive in terms of safety. Again, doesn't really matter in that recreational range of 60 to 80 feet, but if you're going deeper, um, no model is perfect. But one of the biggest problems I have against the RGBM model is that it's proprietary and it was never released to the public. And so it's really been one guy who evaluated that code and made the adjustments and did the mathematical computations. I don't trust one guy. I trust a lot of people who take a real hard look at data and come up with errors because we all make errors. So next question, is there a specific computer you recommend? I am a fan and I will say this because it's true. I'm a fan of Shearwater computers. And I have received funding from Shearwater in the past for research, but they don't buy my opinion. And if they ever made a crappy computer, I would be uh, right up there saying that it's true. But 
I like them for a couple of reasons. One, the default is a Buhlman model. And two, most of their computers have a two button control. And one of the other problems with computers is it's really easy to forget how to use them. With a Shearwater, you have a button to advance and one to select. And if you forget and you go too far, you just keep going until the that screen you need comes up again and then you select it. And I like computers that don't require a textbook to remind me of whether it's a long push, a short put, push, three pushes, or what I have to do. And so I am a big fan of, of Shearwater. But uh, any computer that runs a Buhlman to me would be preferable to a uh, bubble model, a VGM, uh, RGBM, or a VPM. And I will say, okay, in Shearwater, Shearwater does have a watch that I think is only good for free diving and travel and to look really cool because it's not a two button controller. And so the watch that has four buttons is not as easy to use. And so I'm not a fan of that on Shearwater. I like the standard computers that are two button control. There's a question that was before that. Can you touch on ascent speed? Ah, okay. We uh, at Divers Alert Network did a study on ascent speed and we were looking at a, comparing a fast and a slow rate of ascent. And we actually had to stop the study early because we found we were bending way too many people on the fast ascent speed. And that fast ascent speed was 60 feet per minute. Mm. <laughs> so, oops, who knew? And that's one of the reasons why a lot of computers are now encouraging you to maintain a, a 30 foot or 33 foot per minute ascent speed because the 60 foot per minute ascent speed is problematic. But let me throw a complication in there too. I have a problem with computers that control your ascent speed consistently throughout, because when you're deep, going up at a slow rate is counterproductive. When you're really deep, coming up a decent amount is a relatively small relative pressure change. And so if you're doing a deep dive, get the hell off the bottom. But the closer you get to the surface, the slower you should be moving. And so um, as you're getting closer and closer to the surface, you should be going to a crawl and adding your extra stops, whether they're safety or decompression. So the closer you are to the surface, the slower you should be moving. And ascent, 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 ascent speeds are very important. If you do a uniform ascent speed, it can get you in trouble. So you should be doing progressively slower ascent speeds. Any other questions, comments, myths you want to bust or you want to reinforce? How important is age or is it really about fitness? Now, that's a good question. Age, there's a lot of talk now between um, biological age and you know chronological age. And that is the big deal. Age alone is not the factor it used to be. In the 80s, I dived with a woman who was 76 years old, and she was being written up by Diver Magazine as one of the oldest women divers around. Well, now we would look at a 76-year-old and go, what's the big whoop? Um, things change. As people are more fit, they do very well. At Duke, we started an aging diver study, and this was actually Richard Moon who started it, so I'm using the royal we there. But they were doing an a aging diver study where they were trying to look at older fit and older unfit and compare them against younger fit and younger unfit. They actually had to stop the study because they couldn't recruit unfit older divers. Nobody unfit wanted to volunteer. But the one paper that did come out of it, and the first author was Heather Mummery, um, what they found was older divers, if they were fit, there was no reason they could be seen that they were not able to dive. And the best example I had, we had a, I believe she was 76 at the time, 76 year old triathlete. And she started triathlons later in life, but she just, she embraced it. She was really fit and she was perfectly functional. So it really is about the shape you maintain. It's not just, it's chronolo chronological age is, is not a good indicator. Great question. Okay, how bad is skip or box breathing really? Well, it's not so much that it's bad, so much as it's useless. If you skip breathe, you can control your ventilation for a short period of time, but your body will make up for it. 
And so you skip breathe now and in seconds or maybe longer, you will start hyperventilating to compensate. So the best breathing pattern to conserve gas is the one that you're not aware of doing. So when you're able to breathe so in such a relaxed manner that you're not even aware of it, that's your best. But to, to actively use skip breathing, it's not helping you. And as another downside, it is causing your CO2 levels to rise and rising CO2 levels are a risk factor for decompression sickness. So skip breathing is not a good idea. The best thing to do is to be so relaxed that it's like you're asleep. The zen of diving is really the, the way to go. Good questions. What else do we have? Come on off mute if you'd rather than do Chad. Um, really fascinating. I, uh, you know, I hear people all the time that as they're getting older, they say, well, I just dive to 30 feet now or 45 feet, just as an extra safety margin because I'm over 50 years now old or 60 years old, you know? And it's kind of this perception that as you're older, you're less able to metabolize, you know, the gas or. But it's not so much gas metabolism, but to handle nitrogen, it's true. I've actually been monitoring myself with ultrasound for more than 35 years now. And dives that never used to cause me to bubble, now I bubble like there's no tomorrow. You have a choice. You either get old or something worse. Those are your only two choices in life. And so I think you have to embrace the aging. You you really have to embrace the fact that we can't tolerate as much, but it's probably not quite as much metabolism of oxygen, but we're, we're just not as good overall at processing inner gas as getting rid of the gas. We have uh, lower quality circulation. We have a lot of things that do creep up on us. So adding conservatism is a good thing. A guy named Bruce Bassett in 1982 said that over the age of 30 for each decade, you should be cutting 10% off the U.S. Navy no decompression limits. Now, I think that's a little bit extreme, but the concept is good. As you age, particularly as you get less physically and medically fit, you should be adding more buffers. But it's hard to come up with a number of how much. But the way I start is if you don't want to do anything else, I believe that it's a really good shift to shift to nitrox and dive it on air table limits. If you do one thing, that would be a great one. And then you can also embrace gradient factors and use more conservative ones. But diving nitrox on air tables, as long as you make sure you avoid the deep depths that could give you oxygen toxicity, it's giving you a decompression advantage that probably makes up for some of the vagaries of aging. And I would still much rather take aging than not aging. <laughs> And what advice would you have for a breath hole diver to get better in terms of what should they focus on? Yeah, well, it depends on what they want to do. You certainly, one of the strongest things you see in, in smart free divers is that they improve incrementally. They don't try to make big jumps. You want to try to progress slowly. We have had a number of people who've gone from non-free divers to national, if not more, more impressive record, record holding because they had a predisposition that they just didn't recognize. So there are some people who end up being really good at it. But when it comes to things like the physical training, increasing flexibility in your airway, increasing diaphragmatic flexibility, that takes time and practice. Even though it's really uncomfortable, one of the diving practices that has really good safety is empty lung diving. Because you can simulate the stresses on your body in a very shallow body of water. And so if you have a problem and you're appropriately spotted, you can um, be fairly safe. Or you can use a counterweight system to make sure that you're not unprotected. You really wanna make sure you have the protections, but things like empty lung diving, they are a good way to simulate deeper dives without the depth. So that reduces your risk. But a lot of it, you just have to put in the time because there's a huge psychological component of free diving and that just takes the exposure. I Empty lung diving to me, it's amazing. When, if For those who don't know it, what you do is you exhale everything you can, and then you try to spit out a little bit more so your lung is as empty as it can be. Then you close your mouth and dive underwater in a pool. 
every survival instinct I have tells me this is not a good idea. <laughs> but physiologically, it's a good way to train your body because your body is feeling the squeeze at 30 feet that you might have to go to 200 feet on a normal dive to experience. And the psychological stress is massive. And so there are some techniques like that. But you have to be mindful that it's hard to, to change your state quickly. So you have to put in the time and you have to make sure that you're working with a team that supports each other so nobody is doing it alone because that's that other major life threat, practicing and alone. I know some people have done that and they've gotten lung squeezes. Oh, absolutely. You, lung squeezes are very common in free divers and the standard in the community largely has been breathe oxygen for a little while and take a day or two off and you're good to go. And that's not necessarily enough. There was a fellow who actually died in competition and he had a lung squeeze two days earlier, took a day off, but he competed on day four of the event and he had some problems. He did a turn and then he went back, he turned to a board, then turned to go back down, then turned to come back up. He hit the surface and he ended up having, um, he, he bled out. He had such massive bleeding that he died on site. And so squeezes can be mild, but they can also be a very serious threat. And this is why you want to progress very, very slowly so you're not pushing too hard. Because the thing you have to remember about free diving, when you do your turn, you are literally just halfway through the dive because you're typically traveling down and up at the same rate. And so you have to be very cautious not to bite off more than you can chew or you can run into huge problems. So you really want to progress very, very slowly with patience. And I know that's hard for people, but that's how you stay out of trouble. And that, that progressive uh, training will help you to avoid a lung squeeze. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, yes. As you start to get more flexibility of your diaphragm, for example, one of the reasons why we have severe squeezes is when we go below resid residual volume, we start to have a negative pressure that is causing blood to shift. And if you can increase the mobility of your diaphragm, you can increase the mobility of your airway, you can actually reduce your functional residual volume down to a fraction of what it would be in an untrained person. And that means that you are more resistant to the squeeze environment because you don't have the same residual volume to start with. You're able to go down to a much smaller volume before it becomes problematic. So that comes with training. So yes, training can help protect you against squeezes, but it ultimately, everybody gets squeezed. The trick is to progress and only dive within your limits to make sure that the squeeze is not problematic. If you're coughing up blood and you have a, a frank squeeze problem, you really should be reevaluating re where you're going and um, backing off to go more slowly. Coughing up blood is not a benign sign. Understood. All right. Any other questions? So I'm going to end it there. And thank you so much to our speaker and for everyone who came this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch this off. Well, it's a great pleasure. I hope everyone has safe diving. Yes.